Greetings, ladies and managers, and welcome to the latest narration of the web series The Survivor Becomes a Dungeon. If you're new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below in the description. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 127 But Maury Point of View Despite my earlier confidence when leaving Tilson behind at the Crucible Master's home, I've come to realize that there was now a major obstacle keeping me from going back to the inn with Lugosi and the Cubs. That is the fact that I'm still an unknown individual without any kind of documentation, and there is nobody to escort me through the checkpoint into the inner city this time. Based on what Cecil said, they perform some kind of magic screening on people like me, whether it's as invasive as a magic x-ray or something like a metal detector wand. I'm certain that I would somehow trigger both, and I'd rather not deal with having to explain myself for each and every little thing that may potentially notice. So, how should I get inside? I could maybe attempt to scale the walls. I don't have to worry about getting tired for my grip strength considering that I'm made of wood. Yet, it is early in the morning, and with the sun at my back, I wouldn't have any sort of shadows to rely on unless I walked all the way around to the other end of the fort town, which probably wouldn't help by the time I get there. Perhaps I could go through the sewers. I don't have to worry about physically reacting to any smells, yet I also don't want to dirty my brand new clothes or explain why I smell like the sewers once I return to the end. Maybe I could sneak in through the back of a cart or cling to the underside of one and hide as they cross through the checkpoint. They weren't especially thorough from what I remember yesterday, yet that could also just have been a particular set of guards, and maybe the morning crew is much more vigilant. There are quite a few possible points of entry, but all of them have their risks, and I don't want to deal with having to fight or flee from the guards if I were to make any kind of mistake. As my eyes trailed the stone walls of the fort, I'm suddenly hit with a realization, as I smiled to nobody in particular. If all current points of entry have risks, how about I just make myself a new entrance? Moving along the stone walls and giving myself a good amount of distance away from the gate, I eventually managed to find a spot in which looked like a residential area with little to no foot traffic and no guards in sight. I loitered for a couple minutes, just trying to get a feel for the area and any possible witnesses. Yet despite looking especially suspicious, just standing around with my hood up, I felt no eyes land on me at any point. Using a combination of earth and spatial magics, I carefully pulled the stone into my storage, making myself a path about five feet deep into the wall before doing my best to seamlessly seal up the opening behind me. Pressing forward, I cross another ten feet of stone before I find myself coming out the other side of the fort's wall. It's a rather slow process, and while I had long since trained myself to get used to tight spaces, the fact that I didn't need to breathe or suffer the consequences of my own body physically and chemically reacting to the conditions around me certainly helps when it comes to keeping my composure. Now that I am close to the other side, I carefully carve out a viewing slit and peek out. From where I am, I spot another street, yet another residential area, and even now, there isn't all that much traffic. A few people pass by, a mother and a child, a couple of teenagers, and the older man, Biding my time for another seven minutes, I finally crossed into the open and sealed up the wall behind me, as quietly as I could manage before briskly walking away down the path. The seconds turn to minutes as I find myself back on the main road. Yet nobody bothers me or looks particularly interested in me in any way. Ha! I dare say that was one of the easiest infiltrations I've ever pulled off. Magic really is pretty useful. Not that I had any doubts about its versatility. It isn't long before I make my way back to the inn pulling my hood back as I step through the doorway. Inside, I'm greeted with a similar scene as last night, if not more reserved as most of the various patrons and guests appear to be either shrugging off last night's alcohol or working the sleep out of their system as they eat or drink whatever brews they get them going in the morning. I was halfway across the common area when a set of eyes locked on me and an excited young mage proceeded to make his way over, staff in hand as it was tapped to the ground in every few steps. Good morning, Vito. I didn't realize that you were already out and about. It is good to see you. Cecil enthused cheerfully enough, before brushing some of his hair out from his face as he looked up at me. Well, I was vaguely expecting something like this to happen. I didn't realize he would wait for me in the inn first thing in the morning. It seems that whatever trepidation he had about me being an eccentric, that he recognized me to be, was greatly exceeded by the anticipation of being around me and possibly learning something from me. I simply offered a bit of a smile as I gestured for him to follow. Good morning, novice Cecil. It's good to see you again. I trust the guild was satisfied with the results of your hunt. 
I asked, letting him talk about his own things before he could ask me about whatever I was up to. Cecil eagerly followed it along as he bobbed his head, but... Yeah, we got some good coins for the hides and tusks that the job tasked us to get. And we got a little extra selling the blood to some alchemists and the meat to a couple butchers. All in all, it was a tidy little sum, he explained as we reached the second floor and made our way up to the third. At the mention of a tidy sum, I suddenly remembered that I'd promised his party coin for getting me into town. Not to mention that Cecil himself spent some coin in the process. Ah, oh, that reminds me. I owe you a bit of coin myself, don't I? I mentioned, glancing back at him as we walked down the hall before going up to my door. Cecil looked a little sheepish at that as he merely shook his head. No rush, Vito. I'm aware that you've only just arrived and are likely still getting settled in. You can pay when you're ready at a later date, he explained as he scratched his cheek at that. I just chuckled a bit as I glanced back at him. No can do. You've done me a service and at a cost to yourself. It is only right that you are compensated for your efforts in a timely manner. At that, I opened the door to my room, only to be greeted by the sight of Lugosi and the cubs quietly eating from three different plates of meat. Upon seeing me, the cubs excitedly morelled with delight and rushed me, quickly climbing up and perching on my shoulders as they both nuzzled their heads against mine. All the while, I did my best to return their affection with the throat scritches and nuzzles with my chin. Lugosi, for his part, regarded me cheerfully enough before going back to his plate as he savoured the seasoned meats. I felt Cecil look rather delighted upon seeing my beasts again, though he looked at me once more, lowering his hand out of respect before standing tall again. No right, Vito. I won't protest more than I already have, he mused sincerely. Good man, I enthused cheerfully enough, before regarding the cubs. All right, you two, go finish your breakfast, and then we can head out and stretch our legs. The cubs were admittedly reluctant to leave my side, but at the prospect of getting to head out again, Rayleigh scurried down my side and returned to her food. As Maury stalled for a little while longer before reluctantly joining his sister, as he ate his own food as well. Looking at Cecil again, I pulled ten silver from my storage and held them out in a closed fist, waiting for him to be ready, as he ended up needing a moment to realize that I was paying right then and there. He quickly held out both hands, cupping them together as I poured the coins into his palm. There we go, he blinked with surprise, and I could sense he was clearly expecting to only get four silver pieces those we had discussed before. Vito, th this is too much. I can't accept all this, he said, looking perturbed by the silver in his hands. I chuckled softly at his expense as I pulled away, not letting him hand the coin back to me. Also, every coin there is earned. Four silver for getting me inside, three silver to cover the expenses that came up on the job, and another three silver for getting me such nice inn, I explained, before sitting back on my bed, now just waiting for the others to finish eating. I could sense that Cecil wanted to argue at least a little bit, but then he came to the conclusion that there was no reasoning with an eccentric before simply sighing and smiling a little more. Uh, thank you for your generosity, Vito. Now then, what are you up to today? I asked, looking at Cecil as I leaned forward, resting my elbows on my knees. At that, Cecil looked admittedly sheepish as he scratched the back of his head. Uh, I'm not doing all that much in particular. Rance is out shopping, making sure that we have enough supplies to make the trip to the capital tomorrow, and Lily is finding paperwork with the guild to report our leave of absence in regard to local affairs. How oh, that does get my attention as I quirked about him. Have you been snooping around my affairs? I asked teasingly while doing my best to play it straight. Cecil is momentarily startled and perhaps maybe a little too frightened, as he frantically shakes his head. No, 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 of course not, your grand mage, Vito. Whatever would make you think such a thing? I dialed it back, bashing a smile, now as I met his gaze. Dispense with the formalities, novice. I'm merely pulling your leg, I mused before sitting up a little straighter. I only said that because I also have business in the capital, and I plan on heading out tomorrow morning. I explained as I chuckled a little more at his expense. A strange coincidence, isn't it? He gulped anxiously, running his fingers through his hair, before offering another sheepish smile. C Quite the coincidence, yes. So why are you making your way to the capital? Is there any reason in particular? I asked as I stood, noting how Lugosi and the cubs were nearly done with their food. He bobbed his head thoughtfully before looking up at me. We're off to get our ranks assessed at the Adventure Guild's main branch for this country. We've qualified for the promotion for some time now. We just needed to save up and pay for the opportunity to get assessed. I nodded in response, though tilted my head a little with curiosity. 
Why do you need to go to the capital to get assessed? There's a guild here, no? Cecil just smiled a little as he shook his head. The guild here is all well and good, but they only allowed to assess up to a steel rank, he explained as he reached around the collar of the robes and pulled out an interesting little dog tag that looked like it was made of steel. Once we enter the gem ranks, adventurers must be assessed at bigger guilds since they all have the proper facilities and resources to test our abilities and measure our character. I see. And how long will the journey take you? I asked as Bismari finished his food and immediately ducked into my shadow, Lugosi going over and sitting by the door while Freddy began to climb my leg and then my back before perching on my right shoulder. Cecil looked thoughtfully again. Between walking on foot and having to bring along our cart to carry our supplies, it'll likely take us a week to get there, he explained, before smiling a little as he made eye contact with me. That's quite the journey, I commented before regarding Lugosi and gently patting his head. We could likely cut that down by maybe two or three days if we push it. Looking back to Cecil, I flashed another smile while pulling away from Lugosi. Well, I've got some time to kill. Do you have a training area of some kind around your guild? I want to see what you're made of. At that, Cecil's eyes practically gleamed with excitement. Truly? Do you really mean it? He asked, and I could tell it took every ounce of dignity that he had to not grab me like an excited child. Yes, y yes, we do have a training area. Come on, follow me, he said excitedly, as he opened the door for me and led us out of the inn. It doesn't take us all too long to get to the guild. Passing by, it's once again a similar scene as to what I saw yesterday, though there seemed to be even more people as they crowded around notice boards or lined up at the receptionist's desk seemingly getting started with whatever business they planned for the day. Moving past the main hall and proceeding further into the guild's complex, we come into what looks like a rather large open-air training area. There were stations and sitting areas strewn about the place, with snacks and barrels of what I should assume were water and other kinds of drinks. Just looking around, I spotted a number of children and younger teens being instructed in various forms of combat in what appeared to be a rather systemized training regime. A majority of them appear to be close-range fighters, with a wide mix of weaponry and combat styles. Beyond them are the long-range fighters, practicing with a variety of projectile and thrown weapons, everything from slings, bows, crossbows, and throwing knives. The smallest group looked to be around five children, who appear to be mages of some kind. If Cecil is what he is considered a novice, then these mages must be apprentices, who are still learning the basics of spellcasting. Quite an impressive setup around here, I mentioned as I walked with Cecil. This whole place reminded me of a compound I grew up on. Of course, there was less gunfire and machinery, and a lot more magic and swords, but the overall feeling was rather nostalgic. Cecil smiled a bit as he looked around as well. Well, it's not academy training grounds, but the instructors here are quite experienced and rather thorough in their teachings. So you're academy trained, I asked as I recalled Rita's own experience as the academy student. He bobbed his head intently. My parents helped me get the training in the academy when I showed a talent in for wielding magic, though I only stayed for a few years to get through my fundamentals before setting out as an adventurer, he explained as he flashed a cheerful smile. I, I could have stayed longer, maybe taken up a specialized education as some kind of artificer or researcher, but I couldn't see myself staying cooped up like that. To each their own, I mused before looking him over as we crossed training grounds, going to the area that was sanctioned off for the spellcasters. Once we found a good empty space, I mentally suggested to the Cubs and Lugosi that they go hang out in the nearby rest area while I worked with Cecil. Freddy and Lugosi took me up on it quickly enough. Lugosi sat in the shade while Freddy sunned herself. Besmori, for his part, seemed to be content with lingering in my shadow for the time being. Now then... Tell me what your affinities are and what you hope to learn from me, I say, as I give my full attention to Cecil now. Cecil was momentarily taken aback at the sudden change in topic, as he tapped his fingers against his staff to consider himself for a couple of moments. Well, uh, I specialize in water and life magics, though I do use some of the other elements' branches when needed. But my strongest ties are to water, he explained before looking up at me again. I've been having trouble with the force of my spells. I feel like I can output more power than I currently am, but when it comes to actually casting, the force of the spell just falls off after a certain threshold. I'm not sure where the issues are stemming from, so could you watch me and see if there's anything I'm missing? I feel like there's a performance issue joke in there somewhere, 
but I also feel like it wouldn't be right to poke fun at something that appears to be a serious concern for him. Very well, novice, cast some spells, and let me see what you've got. Cecil flashes a cheerful smile, though he doesn't move yet, watching me expectantly before curiously quirking a brow. Aren't you going to write a magic circle or something to cast a detection spell so that you could watch how the magic flows through my body? Ah, that's right. Most mages can only sense that there's magic in something or someone, but generally can't tell the specifics without the aid of tools or certain spells. Well, I suppose there's no need to lie since he already believes me to be both learned and powerful. I just flash a little smirk and quirk about him. There's no need for me to do all of that. I can already see everything at will. Just go ahead and cast your magic whenever you're ready. Cecil is once again taken aback by the revelation. Though he smiles in response before bobbing his head. Yeah, of course, Vito. He enthused as he clutched his staff, taking a moment to consider what he should do before holding it up above his head. I could see the manor start to swell around his heart and course along his arm before traveling into the staff. It all looks good, and I don't see any... Hold on. There it is. It's the staff that's the issue. There's some kind of defect around the end of the staff itself. That's not even considering the quality of the crystal at the end. Well, it's not bad. When paired up with the defect in the staff, I could see why he could feel that there's a drop-off in the power of his spell casting. As Cecil finishes his casting, he manages to conjure a small rain cloud that is ten feet up in the air, maintaining it as it starts letting down a small drizzle. With his concentration lingering on the cloud, he glances over at me and flashes a rather hopeful smile. Well, uh... What do you think? Even as he waited for my answer, the five little mages made their way over with their instructor and watched Cecil maintain his magic. The instructor did her best to explain what Cecil was doing and offer informative comments on the technique to her students. Even then, I could feel that she was glancing over at me as well, recognizing Cecil to be a competent mage who is usually around these parts, but wondering who I could possibly be. I just smile a bit, nodding with my approval as I close the distance between myself and Cecil. Everything looked good to me until the end. That is, I explained before holding up my hand. Could you lend me your staff? I could sense a spark of hope and a little confusion as he bobbed his head intently and held his staff out. Uh, of course, Vito. Taking up the staff, I ran my own manner through it as I studied it more closely. After a few moments, I spotted the imperfection again. It looked like dry rot, and it was right along the central vein of the staff where the mana activity flows through it. Upon closer inspection of the gem, it did have quite a few impurities, but as far as I knew, that wouldn't have hindered his ability to cast spells. At least, not on its own. Yep, it's your staff that is the issue here. See, dry rot, I explain as I hold Cecil's staff out for him to see. The other young mages and the instructor peeking over curiously at the staff as well. Cecil looked stupefied by the revelation, and perhaps a little sick and defeated, as he looked between me and the staff. All this time, all this time, I thought there was something wrong with me, and it was just my staff this whole time. I bobbed my head a little, offering a smile as I handed him the staff back, before gently patting his shoulder. Think of it like this. You're now better than your equipment. You may have not noticed this when you were weaker. But now that you've reached a certain level of strength that your equipment just can't keep up with. At that, a small smile did show in his face as he looked between me and the staff again. Yeah, you're right, he enthused cheerfully enough. I chuckled a little bit before regarding the staff itself for a moment. And you know what, a new staff is something I can definitely help you with. Just give me a moment, I muse as I decide to have just a little fun. Glancing at my left arm again before bringing up my right hand and placing it around the base of my upper arm and shoulder. Without warning anyone or saying anything, I use a little water magic to carefully cut off the arm without damaging my clothes. In the next moment, my arm suddenly fell off and landed limply in the dirt, causing the young mages to scream and run away. Cecil and the instructor were admittedly more startled by the screaming kids than they were with my arm falling off. And it took everything not to smirk or laugh at their expense as I played it straight, collecting my arm by its wrist. What? It's a prosthetic, I said as casually as I could manage. End. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. 
Thank you very much.